so today we are going to uh, talk about uh, give an overview about our lab course, which is uh, which we are trying to orient in Sri Lanka. And for that, we have two guests. Uh, uh, Dr. Shan, a GMC registered doctor, will be talking and walking you through uh, of PLAP. And then we have uh, Dr. Aryu Vaidyaratna, a general practitioner uh, who is currently working uh, in the UK and who uh, he was graduated uh, from University of Leicester. So he will be walking you through about the current situation in the UK and, and he will be talking to you guys about the shortage of the doctors in the UK and the political side of uh, the NHS. Uh, so uh, we will start uh, with Dr. Shan. Um, Dr. Shan, can you hear me? Hello, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you are yeah, loud okay. and clear. So okay. we will, all right. I'll so let me you. switch on my camera as well, yeah? Okay, uh, can you see me clearly? Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello guys, I'm Dr. Sean, um, a GMC registered doctor. I recently got through my lab, uh, you know, one and two. And uh, so I'll be giving you an overview of uh, this lab masterclass orientation, where we'll be talking uh, a bit about lab, uh, how it works, and what we at AMREC have been uh, offered for you guys as well. So uh, before any delay, let's uh, go ahead with the plan. Uh, so basically, okay. So um, what I need to talk to you guys about is uh, the PLAB1, uh, to give an overview of PLAB1 and UK MLA, because uh, as you all know, um, in 2024, Lab one is going to change into something called UK MLA, which uh, I'll be talking to you guys in a couple of slides. And uh, in order to go to UK, you need to pass the PLAB one, which is um, the theory exam, and then the PLAB two, which is the OSCE based or the clinical exam. Right. Uh, along with that, one important thing is before you do your PLAB one, you need to complete your OET which is the English exam. People prefer doing IELTS as well. However, most of our students um, find OET easier because uh, it's uh, fully medical based and much more uh, easier in terms for medical graduates and also for you know healthcare professionals like the nurses. So before, uh, before I go in, let me just tell you about PLAB 1 in general. So, uh, PLAB 1 is basically a written exam which is made up of 180 multiple choice questions, which consist of single best answers out of five. Right? So, um, here we have three hours, which is roughly 180 minutes um, of uh, your time. So, if you, if you think about it, you have 180 questions, you have 180 minutes. That means you have one minute per question. Right. So when you do this exam, it's more of uh, what you call a practice that you need to implement because there is no scope for error. There is no scope for thinking and waiting and, you know, staying in a question for so long and wasting time. So you have to be a bit quick. OK, and most of our students are asking, is there minus marks? Do you have true or false scenarios? Well, um, apparently there is nothing like that. You just have a single best of five and you choose the best out of five. And uh, well, that's PLAB 1. And when I talk about UK MLA, so what's going to happen in 2024? For people who have booked their PLAB 1 seats in 2023, this year are going to follow the structure that I just mentioned. The PLAB 1, 180, 180 minutes, and the single best answer question. But in 2024, they're going to implement a new process, which is known as, as you can see in this slide, United Kingdom Medical Licensing Assessment, right? So what's going to happen is it will be a requirement for both the UK graduates as well as the international medical graduates. Unlike the, you know, PLAB exam, where PLAB 
is only done by the international medical graduates like Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, all over the world. But this system, which is being implemented in 2024, is something where we all, as IMGs and the local grads, will be doing as one. So, in UK MLA, there are two more structures. Number one is the Applied Knowledge Test, AKT, right? So basically, it's just like PLAB 1, which is a theory based, but things are going to uh, change, uh, you know, uh, into becoming a bit more harder as uh, what they say in the GMC. It's going to be a bit more hard and um, and people have to, uh, you know, change the way they think and how they approach PLAB 1 because it's uh, going to be a bit uh, more of, a, you know, one step ahead of the game. So then we have uh, the part two, which is PLAB part two, and now it's going to be called as a Clinical Professional Skills Assessment, CPSA. It's going to be the same as PLAB two, where you will have OSCE based, you know, clinical scenarios, stations where you need to talk, take clinical history, give your investigations, give your diagnosis, come up with a good management plan, things like that, which is going to happen in Manchester, where you have to go to the UK. So this is the whole structure which is going to change from 2024, right? So you might think or you might ask, right, so if this structure is going to change, how are we going to, you know, come into, you know, how are we going to provide you with the service? So basically we have a skill set of consultants who are very well prepared for this and they're very competent in order to teach what is necessary. Uh, nevertheless, it could be PAB, it could be UKMLA, it could be AKT, it could be MRCP. No matter the exam, the structure and the teaching is going to be a standard. So that's what our course is going to give you guys in the future. Moving on to the next slide, I'll tell you what we have in for you guys. So when you when you look at the slide, you can see that there is a course of 96 hours which is of three months duration and 12 weeks long, right? We are planning to implement uh, each uh, this system where you have each consultant teaching each subtopic of PLAB. As most of our, you know, um, candidates are, you know, either in the RHO period, SHO period, and we have even few uh, doctors who are fresh out of, uh, you know, medical university, we all know that we have done the final year, you know, the medical structure, how it goes as medicine, surgery, gin, ops, pediatric and psychiatry. So the same thing is in PLAB 1, UK MLA as well. What we provide is each consultant teaching and guiding you through in order to achieve the best possible uh, marks and the best possible way to pass the exam. We also will be providing something called the Plabable. For those who haven't heard of Plabable, Plabable is something of an online questionnaire or online question bank where it has all the latest updated guidelines, more than 3000 questions. So we are going to give that as a free subscription for six months to you people as well. So apart from this, you guys will be getting plabable and the consultants will be teaching no matter uh, PLAB 1 or UK MLA or whatever the structure change, the medicine is going to be the same. The theory that is required in order to pass this PLAB 1 is going to be the same. Yeah, I do understand they're going to uplift it a bit, make it a bit harder, but the format, um, everything is going to be the same. Uh, Dr. Hindu, am I clear so far? Yes, yes, you are. Uh, do you want uh, uh, the incidents to ask uh, any questions? If if anybody yeah, has yeah. questions uh, yeah, uh, till now, if you can ask if there is uh, anything to be understood. Yeah, before we, we go ahead, yeah, we could do that. So until this slide, uh, is there anything that doesn't make sense or you don't you didn't understand well?
yeah, all good. I think our students are you know quite quite good in this, so uh, they have got a good understanding of uh, PLAB already. Yes, uh, so good. we'll proceed, okay. and then uh, at yeah, the end okay. of the at the end of the slide, we'll anyways have a Q and A session. Uh, yeah. Yes. So so uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, you know write it down and ask us at the end of the yeah. session. And also, it's okay. I mean, uh, I can I can understand you people are. I mean, some of them might be you know shy to come up and answer you know ask questions as well. Don't worry, we are here to you know guide you guys. And if you do feel you know a bit awkward coming off on the camera, you can just type in, and Dr. Hyindu will go through it, and he will present it to me or to Dr. Ubin. So don't worry about that. Just type in your questions and send it to him. Okay. So moving on to the next slide, let me talk about the PLAB two. So now PLAB 1 theory done. It could be done in any country. You don't have to go to Singapore. Now one, one student asked me yesterday, uh, do we have to go to another country in order to PLAB 1? Well, no. In Sri Lanka, we do have PLAB 1 that is being held in BMICH and other centers as well, four times per year. What happens here is that when you don't have seats, for example, during the COVID times, the seats were quite low and there were restrictions. So because of that, for example, if Sri Lanka got 300 seats. During the COVID times, we had got only 100. So when there are 200 students sitting for PLAB 1, so the remaining 100, no matter what, they have to go to another country to do the exam. So so that's why, you know, we, we have to go and do it. Otherwise, PLAB 1 is there in Sri Lanka as well. Now, the next step, the PLAB 2. Once you pass your PLAB 1, you will be able to book your PLAB 2. Unlike PLAB 1, PLAB 2 normally has very high seats. They release 72 seats per day. So each day you have 72, and that means there are abundant and enough seats if you are worried about you know, the, the seats of PLAB 2. Moreover, for PLAB 2, you have to go to the UK because you have to go to the GMC, uh, you know, the center, like just like how you have in Sri Lanka, the SLMC, the Medical Council. In Sri Lanka, you have to go to the General Medical Council in the UK, which is in Manchester, and you have to do the exam there, right? If you talk about the PLAB 2, it's basically a, you know, a structured clinical exam, which is made up of 16 scenarios. One scenario is eight minutes long, and basically it aims for, you know, real life situations, you know, uh, you know, how you how you talk to a patient, how you manage a patient in your daily activity uh, from all aspects, from medicine, surgery, gin obs, pediatrics, psychiatry patient, uh, breaking bad news, you know, a cancer patient, breaking the bad news to them, dealing with angry patient. Sometimes as doctors, we tend to mismanage cases. So how do you deal with patients who are frustrated with our mismanagement? Who have complaints to the authority regarding us. So those scenarios, how do you uh, talk to a patient who is depressed, who is sad, or who doesn't open up? You know, things like that. You need to approach those uh, 16 scenarios in you know um, a unique kind of way. And normally, back then, before 2016, they used to have 18 scenarios, but right now they have reduced it to 16. And you have to pass, uh, um, you know, minimum of 10 and you need to get uh, a minimum score out of the average in order to pass. So it's not only passing the 10 stations, but also passing the 10 plus getting the average score and above that in order to go through the exam. Right. So if I give you an idea what the PLAB2 requires, it's basically data gathering technical and assessment skill. These are the three domains, as you can see. Number one, data gathering. Number two, clinical management. Number three, your interpersonal skills. Each domain has four marks. The maximum is 12 marks, and you need to score the maximum possible in order to pass. We don't know the exact mark required to pass the exam because it all depends on the 72 students who are preparing the exam. Does it make sense so far? Because 30 students might get the scenario in a different way. The other 32 might get in another way. So things like that. You what happens if they add up all, they get an average and depending on the average, you will get the passing score. 
So we cannot tell, right, uh, out of 12, get 8, you'll pass. Out of 12, get 6, you'll pass. You can't say that. Certain scenarios could be 8. Certain scenarios could be 5. Certain scenarios could be 4, depending on how hard your task is. Right. So data gathering, which is basically history taking, physical examination, practical skills, and things like that. Number two is the clinical management. You have to formulate a diagnosis, explain it to the patient without medical jargons, and you have to formulate a medical plan. Finally, the most important thing is the interpersonal skills. Basically, in the UK, it depends on how you approach the patient, how kind you are, how uh, you know how much you show empathy to the patient, sympathize with the patient, how you understand what he's going through, right? And you demonstrate a professionalism where you show that you okay, fine. This is a doctor-patient relationship. There is a confidentiality, and I'm going to protect it. The ethical side of it. So these three are the main domains that you will be tested on when you appear for PLAB two. What we provide is the necessary information, the resources, and the guide in order to appear for PLAP2. Moving on to the next slide, this is what we are going to give to our students. So basically, we are going to give a course of 50 hours with the study materials, uh, including um, all the scenarios and example of scenarios, uh, some sort of scripts and the latest guidelines. Because we do have, uh, you know, Dr. Uvin Vaidiratna, who is in the UK, and he could provide us with the latest updated guidelines as well. Along with that, we'll give you two free mock sessions. That means just like the exam, you will be doing a mock session with us and we'll analyze your scores. And depending on, on that, we'll give you a feedback. Finally, an active role play session where we'll be doing a session like this Zoom on Zoom or, you know, whatever platform we will bring you out there and we'll discuss scenarios with you. In-person hands-on experience with mannequins. What does that mean? Well, in Sri Lanka, we do get to do um, our part two with real patients, right? But in the UK, uh, we don't get to do that. In PLAP2, what they have is mannequins. So we do need sort of an experience in dealing with those mannequins, how to do IV cannulation, catheterization, drawing blood, um, uh, giving a subcut injection, I know most of our doctors have uh, enough competency in, in these you know, skills, but there is a standard protocol that we need to follow when it comes to um, the requirement of the NHS, right? And also we'll be giving you a study center where you can come, practice with multiple candidates, uh, discuss with them, and you know have your PLAB2 journey going. Okay, so what are the additional guidance that is provided by us? So uh, if, if, if I give you a general idea, academies um, all over the world, what they provide is what we do right now, the PLAB1 and PLAB2 guidance. But what we provide is a bit more than the others. We will help you with your EPIC verification, which is required just before passing PLAB2, because you need to get your EPIC verification done in order to proceed. Furthermore, We'll be giving you, uh, you know, guidance on your visa because you have to go to the UK to do your PLAB2. So we'll be giving you, you know, what sort of documents you need to apply, money you need to show, you know, things like that. Finally, uh, the guidance on GMC registration. So hopefully if you pass your PLAB1, PLAB2, you come down to Sri Lanka. Uh, well, in Sri Lanka, when you pass your final exam, you get your SLMC registration straight away, right? Uh, but in, in, in the UK, you have to apply for it. There are certain documents you need to show. There is a uh, there is a history that you need to show for the past five years, what you did, what sort of uh, clinical gaps you have, things like that. So we'll be giving our students a guidance on how to do those procedures as well. Finally, let me give you um, a journey of, you know, to the UK to do PLAB2 because most of our students had this in mind and they want to know, you know, how much it is, uh, what's the price of going to the UK, the cost of accommodation, things like that. Um, so far, is everything clear? Uh, Dr. Hindu, is everything clear so far? Am I am I going too fast or am I going too slow? Uh, well, I think you're doing a great job, but uh, let's ask uh, uh, the students or the, the whoever has joined if they have any questions up to now. Yeah. Yes. They have the ability to answer.
<clears throat> yes, so we have a question. Yes, yes. we have uh, one question saying, um, uh, so Dr. Puvilojin is asking, do we need an internship for UK Millet? OK, fine. So, well, um, if you want to join as a FY2, right, you have to do an internship. Uh, in uh, it's it's known as an acceptable pattern of internship where you can see it on the GMC website. And once you're done with your PLAB journey, you can start your process as FY2. But it's not the case for everyone. Uh, there is something called the UK FPO Foundation where you can start your internship in the UK. So for that, I think Dr. Hindu is best in explaining. Uh, Dr. Hindu, can you make a note and explain, you know, the UKFPO pathway uh, towards the end of the session? Is that OK with you? Yes, I can give a brief introduction about UKFPO uh, right now. So uh, yeah. we'll, we'll have an idea about it. So basically, uh, UKFPO is United Kingdom Foundation program. Um, it is uh, similar to the internship that is given in Sri Lanka in order to um, you know, get enrolled into the, the foundation program, you will have to apply uh, for it one year prior. For example, if you are looking to work in the uh, uh, in the UK in 2024, you will have to apply for the UK PO in 2023. And normally the registration are open in, in the month of June. So what are the requirements for you, uh, for, for us to apply? The only main requirement is uh, you have to pass OET and IELTS, O IELTS, so uh, scoring 400 in OET, and in IELTS you'll have to score 7.5 in all domains, and you'll have to pass PLAB one and PLAB two. And if you have all these necessary uh, uh, requirements, um, you can uh, apply for the UK PO. So um, this is the uh, this is a very brief introduction about the United Kingdom Foundation program. I just uh, said. Um, so I will explain it uh, in further detail uh, later on, or um, if the if the student contact me privately, I'm happy to help. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hindu. So that was a general overview, and uh, well, as you as you saw, when you join with our institute or with AMREC, we do have uh, professionals who have the idea of what you need to do. If you have any sort of hindrance in any any pathway that you have, for example, that uh, it was a good question that was brought by one of our doctors. So we do have uh, consultants as well who are specialized in answering those questions and will guide you and give you a proper idea on what needs to be done. Apart from you know getting the materials and you know study materials. Apart from that, the guidance is also um, included in in this package. So uh, let's let's move on to the journey to the UK. So if I if I break down, this was in 2022 June. Well, um, my journey is a is a bit different. So I'll just take um, you know a journey as a, as an as an overall you know aspect. Uh, so normally when you you know when, when, if I break it down for accommodation, like normally that's that's what people say for accommodation. It's it's roughly 20 pounds per day, which uh, which which adds up to around 600 pounds if you if you are staying for 30 days. Now why why did I put in 30 days? That should be a reason. The reason is because if you go to do the PLAP2 in the UK, you have to join an academy there. I mean, that that's 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 what most people do. So when you join an academy, you have to go roughly one month before the exam. That is the whole whole idea behind it. Well, you could go in three weeks, two weeks before the exam. That's not an issue. But most of our doctors prefer going one to two months or one one and a half months before so that they could go enroll in that academy. There are several academies all around there. There is one in London, Liverpool, Manchester. I mean, actually two in Manchester, one in, uh, I think, South London. You know, like what I'm talking about. So when you enroll in these academies, you have to go at least one month before. So for that, just to live there in the UK, it will cost you around 600 pounds, just, just speaking roughly. And for food, roughly if you put 80 to 100 pounds per week, it, it depends on people to people. You could go less, you could go more. This is the average cost. It will cost you around 400 pounds, yeah? And then for transport, for other expenses, as you can see, uh, along with the academy, the total cost is going to be around 1,700 pounds. You can go and you can search online and you can get the rate. So this is this is where it is in the online as well. 
academies in the UK, when I did it, it was around 500 pounds. But this year, most of my, I think, colleagues and, you know, my juniors said that it has gone up to 600. So the minimum is around 600 to 700 pounds. So if you calculate, the total cost is going to be around 1,700 to 1,800 pounds, just roughly seven and a half to eight lakhs. Just to do the PLAB 2. Well, if you enroll in our course, it's going to be much more cost effective because you do not have to go one month before because you're in Sri Lanka, you're enrolled in our course, you have all the resources here. You have to go to the UK, that is true, but it has it shouldn't be like you have to go one month before. You could maybe go one week before the exam, stay there for a couple of days, get used to the setting, uh, go through some nice guidelines, go through your materials and do the exam, come back to Sri Lanka. So this is the advantage that we, uh, we, uh, especially me and my colleagues, we didn't have because back then we uh, have to go to the UK, join an academy because in Sri Lanka, we did not have a good academy or there was no startups of academies in Sri Lanka for the lab journey. So I believe this is this is where the AMRAC Institute was born and this is how we you know, founded this journey to the UK. Um, you know, um, and helping our students in order to achieve their goals and dreams um, and to practice in the NHS someday. So finally, the last few slides that I have prepared. Uh, so why do you choose AMRAC? So why is that? Uh, th that's what they ask. Why, why do I choose AMRAC? So number one, it's cost effective. As I told you, the cost is uh, just to go to UK and stay there for a month. And uh, bear in mind, this was without the ticket prices as well. So uh, if you take it as a whole, it, it, it's going to be cost effective. And number two. We give a in-depth and personalized guidance for your PLAB journey because we know that um, from individual from one individual to another, uh, things could be different. Uh, for example, one might have an internship. The other person might not have an internship. One person might have an internship, but there could be, you know, an interrupted sort of an internship. There could be clinical gaps. So we give you, apart from the resources and the materials, and uh, forget about the study materials, that's anyways included in the program. Apart from that, we'll help you with, you know, your GMC, your visa, and your EPIC as well. Along with that, you will be saving time because um, people, you know, find it difficult uh, going one month before uh, putting their jobs at risk, um, you know, uh, going to the UK beforehand, staying there for a couple of months and doing the exam and coming. But here, when you're with us, you can stay at home. You could attend the class. If you do miss a class, you can join in again. And we have our LMS, which is the online uh, uh, session where we'll be giving you the. Uh, um, can can we mute the? Uh, yeah. um, okay. 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 Can uh, can we uh, please mute the? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Doctor Hindu. Okay. Yes. Uh, do we have a question? Uh, yeah. Do we have a question? You wake up. Can we uh, mute, please? Please mute, guys. It's, it's difficult right, okay. to. Uh, okay, okay, we'll continue. Okay, okay. So we'll be saving time as well because you will be at home or you'll be um, in your ward, maybe going through the materials. You don't have to, you know, think about going to UK all the way a couple of months before. You know, things are going to be a bit more easier for you guys. Plus, uh, it's easier to obtain visa. This is another question that I need to, you know, tell you why it's it's good to, uh, you know, join the AMRAC Institute because after the Sri Lankan crisis, most of them find it difficult to go to the UK because, um, well, you know the Sri Lankan economy and how hard it is for us to get the visa. Normally, when you go to UK, what they say is that the cost of the trip, for example, if it if the whole trip costs you around um, eight lakhs, eight to nine lakhs, you have to show at least three to four times the amount, um, you know, in your bank account. So that means you have to show almost around 
37 to 40 lakhs, right? So 3.7 to 4 million you have to show in your bank in order to say that you're utilizing only one fourth of it. Because I know people who um, you know, have shown around, uh, the whole trip was around 8 lakhs. They had only around 16 to 17 lakhs in their account and uh, they got their visa rejected because we are using 50% of the whole amount that we have. Some people had to show their um, properties, um, show their vehicles. So, you know, most of our doctors are, uh, you know, they're not abundant enough to show, you know, all of these properties or vehicles and, you know, a huge amount as well. So when you have a shorter duration, right, the amount spent in the UK is going to be less. So when the amount is less, the total amount that you have to show for your visa is also going to be less. So that, in that terms, your visa ch uh, chance of getting your visa rejected is very, very minimal. And finally, the hassle, you know, obviously all our doctors who are working, it's, it's I think uh, most of my colleagues found it very hard uh, for them to get foreign leave. Uh, they had to go to the ministry multiple times uh, because they had to go at least two months, you know, leave a foreign leave and it, it was quite difficult for them to take leave. So in, in our program, basically you just have to take maybe one week, two weeks of leave because your, everything has been done in Sri Lanka and everything has been provided to you guys. So um, finally, uh, what I need to tell you guys is that, um, well, I, I, I do believe that, you know, we have a, a good support system in AMRAC and uh, we do believe that we have a, a, a potential in achieving one of the best academic institute in Sri Lanka, not only, not only in Sri Lanka, but also attracting international students and uh, letting our, our Sri Lankan students achieving their goals and dreams in order to work in the UK and hopefully practice in the NHS as well. So um, uh, good luck and I, this is my presentation and I'll be handing uh, it over to Dr. Uwin Vaidiratna because he'll be talking about how the life in UK, the NHS, the GMC system, everything will be uh, you know, taught by our doctor. So hand it over to Dr. Hainu. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, okay. Okay, so there's a question. When is the soonest yeah. that we can sit for PLAB 1 after following the course? Well, um, the issue over here is that for the PLAB 1 in 2023, uh, due to the black log after the COVID, uh, most of the seats are, you know, not available. Right. So in order to book for this year, you had to, you know, uh, complete your OET and book the PLAB 1C in 2022. So I think the latest possible would be 2023 November. That's that's the latest for now. And in the future, I think Dr. Hindu, you mentioned that uh, GMC is going to release more seats, especially yes, uh, the ones so, that are cancelled. Yes. So, uh, so basically, uh... Uh, right now, the, uh, the the structure of lab is uh, to in order to uh, write the exam, we will have to book the exam one year prior. So for for the lab exam in 2023, um, to, in 2022, all the seats were published. So for 2023, currently all the seats are booked. So if we are looking to do the lab we will have to look for the seats which will be published in this year, which is uh, in March or June. Uh, so if we'll have to book those seats in this year in order to do it in next year. All right, so in order for us to book the seats, we will have to complete OET or IELTS. So that yes. is the main requirement that we need to book the club seat. So what we're offering here is uh, we will be initiating, we'll be starting with the OET um, and getting that out of the way. So then you have the key whenever the seats are published, you can uh, uh, you can book the seats. So uh, GMC uh, currently has not announced when the seat will be published, but last year uh, they, they, had, they were published in March and they were published in June, September and December. So we are hoping that the same system will go uh, in this year as well. So, uh, so, but what what do we have to do in our part is to pass OET and keep that key. Whenever the seats comes, we we, we should be we able to 
book the uh, okay. book the seal. Yeah. Um, yes. So I think that answered the question. Yes. Uh, okay. So we have another question. Uh, mm. Do a PG degree add on as an advantage? Well, um, I think it does um, give you an advantage when you apply for jobs because uh, you know the more degrees you have the more experience you have your cv will be a bit more stronger and um, your interview and uh, you know the things will go a bit smoother so that's that's the advantage it's not like uh, you have a great advantage but however yeah you can have a slight edge over the other students as well all right um is there any questions uh, I think you guys can unmute the, uh, the mic and yeah. speak as well. Uh, that's possible, right? Yeah. You can. Okay. So, so Dr. Harindu, uh, so the so the main thing is our students were asking about the PLAB one, right? So as yeah. Dr. Harindu said, we have to quickly finish our OET. That's what we all did. Like the first thing our seniors told was uh, quickly finish your IELTS or OET. Otherwise, you can't book your PLAB one seats. So we tend to, you know, look and wait for the PLAB one seat and then book our OET and do the exam. When that happens, the PLAB one seat is gone. So that's why we advise most of our students quickly do your English exam, get over it, get your GMC, GMC account registered, and then every day go to the site and see is there a PLAB one seat released or not. And whenever you get, uh, get the opportunity, just go ahead and book it. Yes, that's right. Uh, all right, so uh, we will anyways have a Q and A session at the end of the the, the meeting, but uh, we will hand over uh, yeah. the session to Dr. Uwin. Uwin. Um, is Dr. Uwin there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. uh, so I will uh, give a brief introduction about Dr. Uwin. So Dr. Uwin is a general practitioner currently working in in the UK and who has graduated from a uh, University of Leicester and uh, he will be briefing our students about the life in the uk and uh, and about the doctor shortage the currently currently that's being that, that's there in the uk uh, and so dr win will start off uh, by saying a little bit about uk and about himself and about the the the, the current issue in the uk with the with the doctors all right yes up to you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, so I'm Uvin Vaidyaratna. I'm a general practitioner working in the uh, UK. I'm currently based in York. So yes, uh, when Harindu gave me this opportunity to talk about uh, uh, working as a doctor in the UK and life in the UK, I, I was uh, honored actually to speak to you. So I'll open the floor to everyone. Feel free to ask questions and uh, I can answer any questions you have. Uh, ultimately, the dream is to motivate you and uh, help you achieve this dream of working in the UK and the NHS, and I'll be here to help you achieve that dream, okay? So I'll start by uh, going through uh, my journey to the uh, UK. Uh, so I was born and raised in Nugegode, and uh, I studied in Colombo, and uh, I uh, once completing school, I uh, went to the University of Leicester for my uh, basic medical degree. And um, I uh, once I got my MBCHB, which is the equivalent of MBBS, uh, I work, I applied for foundation year one or F51. So in the UK, as soon as you complete um, your five years of medical school, you get the provisional registration with the General Medical Council. And, uh, with that uh, provisional registration. I, I believe in Dr. Pereira's uh, uh, presentation, there was a question about the UK Foundation program. So I completed the UK Foundation program. And uh, in so as FY1, I did uh, three rotations. Each was four months in length. And my uh, you get to choose your rotations as well. And uh, so the rotations I did were uh, ENT, general surgery, general medicine, and then hepatobiliary surgery, and that was all in Leicester. And once I completed that one year of training, my full GMC registration, and then uh, with 
which with which i did my foundation year 2 and usually you are encouraged to work as you you are encouraged to have an experience of both say uh, district general hospitals as well as say working in a hospital uh, in in a city so for my foundation year 2 i went to uh, catering which is which is a little town in uh, northamptonshire and there i did uh, cardiology general medicine and again a bit of mental health as well so once i completed the uk foundation program uh, they came to the time where uh, whereby which i needed to choose a specialty and i found my calling in general practice Uh, so in the uk um, i think what what's a bit different from sri lanka is uh, it's very primary care based in the sense that gps are almost the gateway to the nhs and to the to secondary care so 90% of doctors almost leaving uk medical school become general practitioners and uh, and then um, uh, the general practitioners in the uk have a lot of power in the sense that all the patients come through to the general gp practice or the gp surgery and then if we can manage it ourselves then we we deal it in the community if not if it's something that needs a referral to secondary care we will refer appropriately to a medicine or surgery or pediatric psychiatry etc um so yeah uh, that that that's how it is in the moment and currently i am working uh, four sessions as a general practitioner so i do three pra- uh, sessions in the gp surgery uh, for primary medical group which is like a, which which is a general practice uh, who are subcontracted under the nhs and then one session of the week i work at uh, his majesty's prison askham grange where i provide healthcare to prison inmates um so w- what i can tell you is that in our day to day practice we use uh, um evidence based medicine and we prioritize nice and clinical knowledge summary so if there's a, a condition that we need up to date guidelines i usually refer Uh, to clinical knowledge summaries and get the most up to date management guidelines and treat appropriately and in um, my, and uh, me and dr harindra and dr pereira's intention is that in the future uh, if you need up to date uh, clinical knowledge summaries guidelines from the national institute of clinical excellence i'll i'll have access to that from uh, considering i'm based in the uk as well um, yeah, yeah i just uh, want to uh, uh, say a small thing here since you mentioned about the about the nice guidelines Uh, so i just want to give a small uh, introduction about what nice guidelines are so these nice guidelines are only accessible in the uk so dr uvin uh, will have all this uh, access and he will be teaching us uh, for lab 1 as well so and he will be teaching the surgery aspect of things and then uh, we will be fully updated on um, any any anything that has been changed in the uk so um, dr uvin will be uh, teaching us and dr win will be uh, helping us with uh, our uh, part for plat 2 as well uh, so yes uh, dr win sorry to disturb i will uh, i will hand it over to you again no it's good that you brought it up and then also the audience if anyone has any questions please feel free, feel free to ask so yes and um, i think there was a there there's a general concern about uh, the N- nhs and uh, and i mean there is a uh, i mean if you look in the news you would say see on the bbc that there is a crisis with the nhs in the moment and i i i feel that every crisis is an opportunity and especially for doctors uh, from south asia from sri lanka india pakistan this is the opportunity for you to come to the uk and provide the service to the nhs i think yeah, i think it's overblown all 
almost as a crisis, but essentially what's happening is there's an aging population in the UK, and that's because of the high health standards. And because there's an aging population, there's always a shortage of doctors, nurses, and any uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, so uh, ultimately, uh, yeah, uh, the NHS is trying to fulfill that short um, staff shortage by recruiting from South Asia and Sri Lanka. So this is where you come in. And uh, hopefully, um, uh, I'm, um, uh, I mean, with the current uh, political situation, with the ongoing crisis for doctor uh, shortage for doctors, I think you will be welcomed in the UK. And uh, yeah, it would be um, an all-inclusive society, hoping for your services here. And um, what what what? What I would emphasize ultimately, um, your communication skills and interpersonal skills are something that that uh, the UK and the general population here almost look into almost more than your clinical knowledge because um, if if your if your interpersonal skills are there and communication skills are there, especially picking up on like verbal cues, non-verbal cues, then you can provide that satisfaction to the patients and uh, the the general population here. Uh, I think uh, expect that from you and and also I think they feel satisfied leaving your clinic room if if you are a doctor who has that communication skills who's able to pick up on those verbal and non-verbal cues during the consultation um, and I, I believe uh, there was a question about postgraduate degrees as well I, I think any postgraduate degree will hold you in good stead working in the NHS and and at the UK, as Dr. Pereira said, it's good experience. And if, if you have a, an expertise in this particular area, you can focus on that and then follow that uh, training program. And uh, I, I would suggest, uh, I mean, what I can emphasize is uh, a postgraduate degree from the UK, say from the Royal College of um, the General Practitioners or any specialty you you like would hold you in good stead going forwards because uh, um, a degree from the Royal College will be respected worldwide and you can go wherever you wish with that postgraduate degree in the UK. So hopefully um, you'll be able to complete Club uh, and come to the uh, UK uh, and and work in the NHS and yeah uh, and if there's any questions, uh, Dr. Harinder, Dr. Pereira, or the audience, please let me know. And is there uh, anything else that you wanted me to cover, Dr. Harinder? Um, yes. Um, uh, so um, our students might be wondering um, whether even though they will pass Club One and Club Two. And even if they get the GMC, uh, the registration, uh, some might wonder, will I, will I get a job or uh, will I be competitive enough uh, to get a proper job in the UK? Because most of, most of my friends and most of the people, uh, they've heard news like about five, six years ago, uh, people have applied for jobs in the, in the UK, but they have not gotten a, a job until now. Uh, so that must be a question that uh, our audience might will, I mean, they have uh, get an answer for. Uh, because um, uh, they might not know the current situation in the UK in depth. Because um, uh, right now the whole the, the, the doctor shortage uh, the UK facing, uh, the nurse shortage UK facing. I think if you give us a, a little bit more a light on it, I think the, the audience uh, will be more uh, enthusiastic to hear and get into this club course rather than going to uh, Australia or the US. Uh, because I feel like there's a much more opportunity in the UK when, compare, when you compare them uh, with the other countries. Yeah, 100%. I can uh, tell, inform you, guarantee you, encourage you that if you got the GMC registration and if you are looking for a job in the UK, you can get it. And because the NHS is always looking for doctors and there's always vacancies and they're, they're, uh, to the level that they, because they have got staff vacancies, they are putting out adverts for locum doctors whereby you can work for a, a very high pay um, 
do shifts ad hoc shifts as and when you need it but you can also get more regular shifts as a trust grade doctor working for the trust uh, so uh, the trust grade doctor meaning you you can get say uh, a contract for six months one one year or two years then extend it going forwards and uh, uh, yeah and there's all uh, there's a uh, doctor shortage and you will be able to get jobs in the uk provided you have the gmc registration so in that sense i can reassure you that um, that that the uk will always be able to provide the jobs you need uh, ultimately um, if you're a doctor with the gmc license there should not be any problem for you having getting a job anywhere in the uk for working uh, at at base various trusts there's always that opportunity available with good pay yeah yes and also i would like to uh, emphasize the fact that uh, since amrec institute is affiliated with durdens we have we have uh, a trust with an nhs uh, and already we have a wolverhampton trust which we are working on with the nurses uh, so likewise if uh, if certain hospitals have any vacancies available uh, durden hospitals can refer you to those hospitals so you can get those jobs easily uh, so that's another advantage of joining uh, with uh, our our institute because uh, since uh, we have a contact with the nhs as well and another thing that comes uh, that is coming into my head is like uh, some students might be wondering okay i don't want to go to the uk i just i want to go to australia and do my amc and uh, pass my amc and uh, settle there um, so i I, I will I will take that question and I will uh, answer. I, uh, so most of the students who are willing to go to the aim uh, to the Australia finding it, it is they are finding it difficult to pass the AMC because uh, the pass rate of AMC is around 40% uh, and uh, AMC part two is even less uh, when comparatively pass rate of PLAB is about PLAB one is about 70% and PLAB two is around 60%. Uh, so, uh, but, but when you go to the UK and work, then get one or one year or two year experience. Going to, if you are planning to go to the go to Australia, you can go to Australia without facing or without doing an exam. So I think that is the main reason why uh, UK is uh, facing a doctor shortage because all the GPs in the UK they are they are moving to Australia since it's it's easier. Uh, because there is no exam for them to face it's just an interview um and when you say that they, they you i mean they have an experience working in the nhs any country would welcome them um open-handedly uh, so that is another added benefit um, of going to the uk uh yeah yeah and i also wanted to raise the point with regard to uh, the job opportunities another crucial issue is that uh, because of Brexit, there are um, less doctors available from continental Europe and less doctors are willing to come from continental Europe to work in the UK. Therefore, that provides the opportunity for doctors from Sri Lanka to go there. And hence why I, I think there's a massive recruitment process for trying to get doctors from uh, the Commonwealth and from countries like Sri Lanka to work because because, because of Brexit, there has been a, dot, a shortage of doctors from continental Europe, thereby providing opportunities for doctors from um, Sri Lanka to come come to the UK and work. So yeah, and uh, Brexit has emphasized and exaggerated that problem of the doctor shortage in the UK at the moment. Uh, yes, and another thing I, I uh, would like to ask uh, Dr. Uwin is uh, about about the Labour government that will be appointed uh, uh, this year. Hopefully, what, what what are your thoughts on that? And and our students and uh, basically immigrants who are applying there, how can that affect us? Yeah, so um, that there will likely be a general election in 2024, and uh, lo uh, looking at it right now, it looks like uh, 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 Keir Starmer will is a prime minister in waiting, and uh, the Labour government will most probably would come to power in 2024. And uh, le the Labour Party in general are very inclusive to immigrants and very welcoming towards migrations. Uh, so. 
things can get uh, things can be lonely in the future in uh, in 2020 and beyond so um, yeah and the, uh, the 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 what the leader of the labor party is currently saying is that uh, no no matter what the issue is they will uh, ensure that there will be enough staff for the nhs going forward so because the, it's a massive election issue here as well the national health uh, service and uh, because What's important about the National Health Service is that it's free at the point of access, but it's a universal health care system. So it's pretty similar to Sri Lanka, but in the UK, pretty much like 90, 95% of the population use the National Health Service. And because it's free at the point of service, uh, point of access, and because uh, it's a, a massive pride for the UK uh, in the the world, they, they will ensure that there will be a, adequate staffing uh, for, for the NHS going forward. And hopefully, uh, when, with the Labour government coming into power in 2024, uh, they, they will be very welcoming and inclusive towards uh, migrants and uh, will overall be very welcoming towards getting people from other countries to work in the UK. So, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I think uh, it, it will be very good uh, going forward in terms of how the UK will look into the world uh, as a place for healthcare and as a place to live really. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wynn, uh, for a wonderful uh, uh, introduction about uh, how things are going in the UK at the moment. Uh, so I, will, I would uh, like to show some statistics. Uh, Dr. Shan will, uh, um, will share his screen and show uh, the current statistics for PLEB 1 and PLEB oh. 2, where Sri Lanka stands at the moment uh, uh, regard, regarding the pass rates. Uh, so, Dr. Shan, can you uh, take that, take over that? Yep. Uh, so, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so... Okay, so um, can you see the screen? Ah, yes. yes. Okay, yeah. so as you can see, uh, well, uh, when it comes to PLAP 1, which is on the right hand side, we have one of the highest passing rates. Actually, we are, we are on top because uh, we do possess, you know, the adequate uh, theoretical knowledge and you know how to approach MCQs and our consultants, you know, the way they teach. However, it's not the same for part two. For part two, Sri Lanka is actually the last. As you can see, only 47.5% of our students have been passed. That's because as Dr. Um, Uwin mentioned, we do lack that sort of interpersonal skills when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, dealing with patients. Uh, most, most probably in Sri Lanka, what we use is uh, uh, more of a doctor-centered approach rather than a patient-centered approach, which is, which is um, you know, uh, which is uh, normally uh, common in the NHS, where they want us to deal with the patients and think about their aspect and uh, to have a great interpersonal skills, uh, showing empathy and sympathy and, you know, things like that. So uh, we can offer uh, you the best possible uh, program in the AMRAC. So we make sure that you pass the PLAB2 in, in your first attempt, uh, because we all know in the end it's very costly and uh, you know you invest a lot of money in this. So hopefully our program will guide uh, and someday uh, we could uh, maybe bring Sri Lanka to, you know, uh, being one of the best in passing PLAB2 as well. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, I, I... I, I think yeah. what's very important is uh, that you have that mutual understanding when coming to a management plan in the UK because the doctor and the patient needs to be at an even level and you come to a management plan um, by asking the patient, you, you can give the options to the patient. This is These are the options available, but ultimately the patient decides what's best for them. And so um, you, you agree on a management plan mutually rather than giving rather than telling the patient what you think what they you should do. do. Yeah, so, uh, exactly. I, and what, what the statistics and the evidence shows is that if there's mutual understanding between the doctor and the patient, 
it's more likely that the patient will be compliant with the ma compliant. management plan and that will benefit the patient going forward. So, um, yeah, th there's a big emphasis on those consultation skills, communication skills, especially um, reaching that mutual understanding between the doctor and the patient so that uh, everyone is on the same wavelength going forward with the plan rather than uh, directing, uh, yeah. uh, telling the patient what to do. Because I, I found that going to Sri Lanka, I took yes. my to, a, to an appointment to see the consultant and it's like the doctor is the boss and the, the patient is, uh, is told what to do and uh, my grandmother doesn't know what to say but is not given that opportunity but I mean I'm not saying that for every case but this is the experience I kind of have and what, what we are trying to reach in the UK is to have that common ground between the doctor and the patient and the so patient. that ultimately we do good for the patient and improve their health because of that mutual understanding in a professional sense yeah in a professional like it, Dr. thank you thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and with Dr. Owen on board um, uh, with our course uh, and Dr. Owen will be teaching uh, you guys how to have that proper interpersonal skill and how to talk to a patient what the uk needs what the uk assessors are looking for uh, from a doctor um, so like dr we mentioned uh, a patient-centered uh, approach um, uh, will be you know taught in in our course as well um, so uh, now it, uh, it's if anybody has any questions we are up for uh, any questions so the question yes, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, feel free to ask any question you have about working in the NHS, working as a doctor, GP in the UK. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. You can type, you can unmute and ask. Yeah. I think there is a question, uh, Dr. Ween, uh, from Tarika Tennakon. Um, yeah. Yes, we already answered that. Um, all oh, right okay the msc right yes okay 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 so if uh there is no questions uh we will we will give uh, you guys uh two or two, three minutes uh to come up with the question uh if you have any questions regarding the course or if you have any regard any questions regarding uh when to book their seats and uh, what's the procedure like and about anything we are open to answer any of the questions you might have yeah and remember we were all in your position as well yes. so feel free to ask any questions uh, don't be afraid don't be shy uh, if, if you want to ask the question in Singhala go ahead uh, like we uh, yeah I'm here to ask we are happy to answer any question you may have Okay, until the students ask uh, questions, I would like to um, ask Dr. Shan about um, his, uh, his, his experience in the UK because he recently uh, uh, he recently did his lab too and he got his GMC register, uh, registered uh, recently and then he will be going to the UK this year uh, as well, probably next month or in March. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Dr. Shan's experience in the UK while doing the PLAP 2. Uh, okay, before that, we have a question. Um, yes. uh, so, so Abe Singer is asking, are you giving study materials for OAT as well? Yes, we are providing OAT guidance as well in this course. So we will be guiding you all with the OAT and we'll be giving materials. We will be giving past papers. So everything will be given to you. Um, so OAT course is um, 72 hours and uh, the four domains which is uh, reading listening uh, writing and uh, speaking will be taught uh, by doctors who've already uh, passed the OET exam uh, who've already gone through the OET exam and who have gotten uh, good marks and then uh, those will be transparent if you all want to see the marks and uh, the, the lecturers and everything will be open uh, to uh, to you guys um, so, uh, like I said before, OET is the key and IELTS is the key to book the PLAB1 seat. So, uh, what I would suggest is uh, 
hopefully we will uh, the seat for club to for club one in 2024 will be published in march so before that i i think you will have to uh, definitely pass oet and uh, have that key in order to book the seats whenever it's available yes all right uh, so i hope i answered that question uh, dr abasing and uh, we will uh, give dr shan the opportunity to talk uh, uh, about um, a little bit and and also uh, uh, and also i would like to uh, hello can you hear me yes Sorry, yes, can you hear Doctor, me? Okay. yes we can hear you um, uh, and a little bit about the course a little more information about the course we are having we are only taking 25 students per intake uh, so that, that is because uh, people are asking why are you taking so so little uh, amount I mean, that is because we are ensuring the quality over over quantity uh, we don't want uh, the because uh, GMC registration is a very complicated uh, uh, thing. Uh, so our doctors, uh, we will be assessing them individually, um, uh, uh, the GMC registration process. Uh, so uh, right now we uh, we have a limited number of seats available. So if you are interested in this course, um, get in touch uh, with the doctors or uh, uh, the people who got in touch with you and um, uh, uh, make the registration fee and get your seat uh, booked uh, before uh, the 25 seats uh, will be uh, I mean, get filled in the future. Um, yes, uh, so I will go to Dr. Shan uh, to uh, you know uh, give us a little insight about his journey to the UK and uh, what he had to you know go through and uh, how his you know how UK was. Okay, so uh, I'll keep it as short as possible because we have to end this session soon. So, uh, well, uh, I, I it, it was not an easy journey for me uh, because uh, I, I went uh, during the time of uh, the crisis where we had the Aragali and uh, everything was a chaos in Sri Lanka. And I had a very difficult time in the UK because uh, I, I loved uh, UK and the vibe and the weather and everything was good because I went in the summer. However, it was hard for me to uh, take money, uh, you know, from Sri Lanka back to UK because everything was limited and, uh, you know, uh, very few um, accesses were, uh, we could only access very little amount of money per week. So it was a bit of a tough journey and uh, also I had, you know, a bad experience with my luggage and, you know, things were missing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it was a very tough journey, but however, uh, it ended up really well because I got through my exam in one go with uh, I think 125 marks because the pass mark on uh, on my day was 90, uh, so I could uh, score uh, you know a couple of uh, you know um, uh, I could score very high in domains such as interpersonal skills that Dr. Win mentioned because uh, most of our doctors they do get the clinical management and the data gathering part of the domain correct and a good mark but however what they lack is the interpersonal skills so lucky uh, that i you know had a you know a good guide so i went through the uh, you know i spoke to one, i spoke to some of my seniors colleagues and uh, got a good idea about the exam and uh, so finally ended up really well and yeah so that's my journey and i recommend everyone you know of you to go to the uk and maybe you know achieve your goals and dreams in practicing in the uk as a doctor Okay, thanks a lot, Dr. Shan, uh, uh, for your uh, exp I mean, for your insight. Uh, all right, okay, so it's time to uh, uh, wrap it up. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can answer. You can ask. You can text. You can text. Yes, I have a question. Yes, thank you. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Dr. Tarka. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all because uh, you are you are going to do the do uh, the great job for our Sri Lanka doctors. Actually, uh, thank you very much for doing that. Uh, uh, actually, I'm going to uh, ask you a question. That it, it, it is a bit uh, personal question. Um, uh, I'm a bilateral amputee, Biloni amputee, uh, following a train accident. So will it affect for uh, any registration in NHS or GMC to get the GMC registration or 
uh, visa approval uh, in th this kind of situation. Hello, um, Dr. Uwin, uh, is it yes. possible for you to answer the question? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah, uh, Dr. Tharaka, I, I don't think yes. it should affect you because uh, ultimately uh, what what, uh, what they would like you to declare is that there's no like um, uh, there's no blood borne infections and such as to the crux. And if it's a below knee amputee, uh, then uh, that, that should not be an issue for you working as a doctor in the UK and uh, for getting your GMC registration. So uh, personally, I don't think that should affect you and uh, that should not be told you from getting uh, the GMC registration. And and in, uh, in what I've heard and what I've read through, uh, the GMC is actually limitations that you have to help you achieve uh, what you want to as a doctor. So uh, that shouldn't hold you back. Does that answer your question, uh, Dr. Tharaka? Yes, thank you very much for uh, answering that. Uh, actually, uh, the, this uh, accident has happened 23 years back. Uh, now I am very competent with my artificial limbs, actually. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, so that won't be an issue, Dr. Tharaka. That won't be an issue yeah. because they have uh, specially mentioned it in their you know, GMC website as well mm -hmm. that uh, you know any disability or any ill health, uh, you know, doesn't, as Dr. Wynn said, it's not a hindrance for your GMC registration. So they are going to support you when you go to your PLAP2 as well. Yes, they so will support don't you. worry about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think what, what they look for in, in any say job say when I when I applied uh, here is that now say when it comes to procedures like vene puncture cannulation is there a risk and from from what you have told me so far there doesn't appear yeah. to be any risk as such and if you're uh, and uh, yeah so I, I don't think it should be a problem for you at all and uh, uh, I, I think uh, the UK will actually be very accommodating uh, for you so yeah yeah Dr. Tharaka uh, I wish you all the best yeah yes okay. Dr. Tharaka hope that that answered your question and thank you Dr. Wayne and Dr. Shan for answering that as well and uh, this uh, so if anybody has questions uh, still they can text or they can ask now um, but I mean if we are going to wrap the session up now so if they have any question they can personally text uh, um, uh, Dr. Shan or Dr. Harindu or Dr. Uwin, uh, we will be guiding you throughout uh, this journey. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have limited seats available for our course. So if you are interested, uh, please do uh, contact uh, our, our, our sales team and um, the numbers and everything is provided. Um, yes, so I hope uh, everything was understood and everything uh, went well and I hope you guys understood everything. Uh, so we will uh, end the session now. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Shan and Dr. Uwin uh, for uh, doing a marvelous job. And uh, we, will, we will be meeting again in the future like, like this. And we will have more sessions. And we will educate the students on um, the recent news uh, of PLAB. And if there are any uh, changes to the PLAB, we will be, uh, we will be uh, you know, telling the students about it. All right, okay then, uh, have a good day everybody.